All right. Have you ever wondered what a super taster is? Or how about the importance of mouthfeel, the texture of wine? We talk a lot about aromas and flavors, but what about the mouthfeel? That's, uh, that's pretty fundamental to your enjoyment of wine. And we're also going to throw into this blend tonight some questions and some issues on climate change and how that's going to profoundly affect the wine styles that you drink. I'm Natalie McLean, editor of Canada's largest wine review site at nataliemclean.com. And we gather here every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern. That's Toronto, New York time to talk to the most interesting people in the world of wine. And uh, we call it the Sunday Sipper Club. Now, before I introduce our guest fully, please chime in in the chat in the comments section. Where are you logging in from? What's in your glass? What's the weather like? I love to hear and see where you're coming in from. I'm going to refresh my browser to see what's going on in the live stream. And uh, let me just toggle down here. So Paul and Patty are here. Beverly is here. And uh, yes, hi, Beverly. You're in Southern California. Were you affected at all by the wildfires? I hope not. I really hope not. So yeah, please let me know. And take a moment um, while we're gearing up here to share this video out. It's going to be a great conversation. So why not share it and tell folks why you think they'd be interested in uh, joining us here on the live. Also, if you're watching on the replay, you can still share this because as you know, what I do every week is if you share and comment, then you're eligible to win a prize. I will be drawing for the winner of last week's prize, which is a signed copy from Mary Ewing uh, Mulligan, her copy, Wine for Dummies book. This uh, this week, we've got a super taster kit that you can do at home. Test yourself. See if you're a super taster. It's a really interesting notion, and we're going to get behind that with our guest. And finally, if you want to take your wine knowledge to the next level, join me on a free online wine video class at nataliemcclain.com forward slash pro. All right. So let me introduce my guest tonight. Our guest this evening is a professor of wine science and researcher at Brock University's Cool Climate Enology and Viticulture Institute in Niagara. He holds a doctorate in wine science from Lincoln University in Canterbury. His focus is on wine flavor and sensory science. He has published more than 100 papers, patents, book chapters, and conference proceedings. He is the inventor of the white wine mouthfeel wheel and the super tasting wine kit and is the co-developer uh, of the wine aroma kits. He's the recipient of numerous research awards and is passionate about wine education and, and of course wine and he joins me now live from his home in Niagara. Welcome to the Sunday Sipper Club, Dr. Gary Pickering. Hello. Hi Natalie, great to be here. Great to have you with us. So um, now, I've got all sorts of questions related to our topic, but I have to, you, you teased me with a story, but didn't tell me it yet. Can we just start with that story about somehow that's wine related or related to you and U.S. Senator Rand Paul? I would love to hear that one. <laughs> uh, sure. Okay. Well, as a as a wine academic, we live very sheltered lives. Um, but <laughs> yes, the, the, one recent anecdote which uh, which I found amusing: um, a U.S. colleague and and I published a study last year uh, looking at taste and flavor sensitivity and how that relates to people's alcohol behavior. Um, and Senator Rand Paul, who was a, a prominent Republican in the U.S. and a member of the Trump administration, uh, picked up on our study. And uh, in a presentation in October to the uh, Federal Spending Oversight Committee, which was considering um, government funding for research, he called our study uh, ridiculous and a waste of NIH money, <laughs> which I assume, is, uh, I assume is part of a wider effort to, to defund science in the U.S., uh, but uh, we academics don't make the political limelight very often, so uh, 
that was kind of fun being criticized by the Trump administration. <laughs> it means we're doing something right. So I take that as a <laughs> I love that. It means you're doing something right. Yes, I would I would consider it quite an honor to be criticized by the Trump administration. <laughs> you're definitely on the right side of things. Okay, without getting too political, but so um, Gary, I would love to dive in. Now you have been a professor and a researcher for a long time. What made you take the academic path, say, versus becoming a winemaker yourself? Yeah, great question. Um, for me, wine was a second career. My, my first career was uh, was in healthcare for for about ten years, and I got burnt out with that. And uh, and sorry, and what did do you do in healthcare? I'm just curious. I was what... a psychiatric nurse. Oh wow! How fascinating! Uh, a yeah, psychiatric well, nurse. Well, wow. Working in, in acute psychiatry. Yeah. Um, I was ready for a career change, and uh, yeah. I've, I've always loved science and uh, always, had always been a, um, uh, a wine drinker, wine enthusiast, played around with amateur winemaking, and those two things sort of coalesced at the time where uh, Lincoln University was offering a new, uh, a new graduate program in, in wine science. So what can go wrong, I thought. Uh, so, yeah, enrolled in that program, and... Uh, uh, enjoyed it so much, continued with that uh, on the research front and I finished my PhD there and uh, I guess the rest is history. So that was around about 1991 that I made that uh, that career change. Wow, that's quite a dramatic pivot as they say these days. That's fantastic. I'm just going to jump in because comments have been coming in, lots of them, which is fantastic. Let me just go over here. I'm going to have to scroll back to catch them. Uh, good evening, Paul and Beverly. You're not near the fires, which is a good thing. Hello, Francis and Jim Clark from Canada is here. Alan is here with a cup of tea for now, not wine. Uh, Marie Walsh has joined us. Allison Fader is here. Nathan Hill, hello from Salt Lake City, Utah. Excellent, Nathan. Are you new to our group? Um, Jason Davies is here from London, UK. Jason is a warrior who stays up really late to join us, <laughs> which is great. Thank you, Jason. Elaine Bruce is here from Calgary. Kathy Braid is here from Pefferlaw. I should know where Pefferlaw is. Is that Ontario? I don't know. Tell me, Kathy, or maybe um, Gary knows, um, but I'm not familiar with Path for Law. Roger Cahill is here from Whitby. Lois Gilbert is here from Toronto. Allison is in Kelowna, BC. And, oh, Lois is in uh, Vancouver right now. She's visiting. Lori is tuning in from Milan, though usually she's in Ottawa. Dave Gardner is here in Ottawa. Um... Yes, it's getting late. I'm sure it is, Lori. Ellen is here from uh, Nova Scotia. Jamie Bothan is here from Florence, Kentucky, a suburb of Cincinnati, Ohio. Florence KY. Okay, that can't be Kentucky. <laughs> um, okay, just signed up. Ah, Tom Nolan. Great. I'm glad you're here, Tom. And Peter Nielsen is here from Windsor, Ontario. All right, I think we're caught up for now, which is great. I love seeing all of you come into our little virtual wine bar here. Okay, so on to the fascinating things that you are doing, Gary, with... Uh, now, I know you do all sorts of very technical research, and but we're going to, because we're layman consumers here, lay women, um, we're going to keep it a bit on the surface as far as you're concerned tonight. But... Um, you developed a, a super taster kit. So before we get into what is that kit, maybe you could define for us, if it's possible, a super taster. What is a, a super taster, especially when it relates to wine? How much time have we got? <laughs> Apparently not enough. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try and be succinct. Um, the, 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 the term super taster was coined by a colleague in the States, uh, Linda Bartoshock, several several years ago. And technically, it refers to people that uh, can taste a particular compound. The compound's called 6M propothyrosol. We call it PROP for short. And what Linda found and some of her colleagues was that uh, when you give this compound to people, they either don't taste it at all, and they're called uh, non-tasters. They experience the compound as somewhat bitter. They're called medium tasters. Or they never talk to you again. <laughs> they experience compound as intensely bitter and, and they're called super tasters. But the really important part of the story is that um, it turns out that 
your, your super tasting status, whether or not you're a non taster or medium taster or super taster, uh, also extends to, uh, to real life, to, to foods and to beverages. So, for instance, super tasters tend to experience the, the sourness or the bitterness in, in wine or in vegetables uh, more intensely than the other types of tasters. Now, it's also interesting because that looks to have um, some health related consequences. So, for instance, super tasters, uh, while they tend to uh, eat less sugar um, and uh, eat less fat, they also tend to uh, eat less green vegetables uh, because they find the bitterness of the vegetables um, uh, aversive. And so that has consequences in terms of uh, risk of some cancers. So it's a really interesting proxy for general taste sensitivity that looks to have some, uh, some interesting health consequences. And our lab has taken this and looked at what that means for alcohol consumption, including wine. And so do super tasters tend to I don't know if this is a conclusion you came to at all or not, but do super t tasters tend to drink more wine or less wine, or is that not related at all? Oh, it is related, and as with most things when it comes to human behavior, the answer is not black and white, um, right. but we've got some general, uh, uh, general indications. And so super tasters overall tend to, to drink less alcohol, uh, including, including wine. Um, and it, if you, but if you are a wine drinker and you're a super taster, it looks like that uh, uh, your preferences for different wine types uh, are generally different than people that are, are not super tasters. And would they be um, toward uh, wines that don't have the bitterness, like a Pinot Noir, not a say Barolo or something like that? <laughs> Yeah, again, that's one of these grey areas that some research, including ours, has found that others have, have found different results. Um, in general, super tasters tend to prefer sweeter things, and so they're more likely to report, report liking and drinking more sweet wine, for instance. Hmm, yes, and um, so this would be related, um, but I had my tongue tested or whatever by Tim Hanai in California, and I'm sure you're aware of him, and um, it turns out I'm a super taster, but I can't walk past the olive section in this supermarket without holding my breath you know it, it and i've heard it described like um not so much that you're a better taster with superpowers super wine tasting powers but that you're just more sensitive it's like living with 500 fingers not 10 i think that was L linda barsh talks uh analogy um but i thought that was quite apt like it's just you're so tuned in so sensitive to everything yeah, um, a couple of things there, Natalie. I mean, first of all, it's, it's an awful term, super taster. And I think Linda herself wishes it was never coined because there's so much, you know, value judgment um, attached to that. You know, look at me, I'm a super taster. I'm actually not, by the way. Okay. Um, in fact, nowadays, we, we tend to use language like hyper taster or hypo taster. And um, you're right, everything else being equal, super tasters uh, have more taste buds, a much greater density of taste buds, buds on their tongue. And what that means is they're getting getting more signal. So when they take a, a glass or a mouthful of wine into the mouth, um, they're getting a, a bigger kick of the bitter compounds, the sour compounds, the astringent compounds, and so on. So they're experiencing things more intensely. And also, um, they have better difference thresholds. That means they can pick up um, small nuances in terms of taste, uh, better than uh, than the rest of us. Is that like being able to listen to a dog whistle or something? <laughs> like it's just a, a higher range of frequency on taste. <laughs> yeah, I think for some super tasters that that, that is the issue, and, and they do yeah. tend to avoid all sorts of of, of aversive food and, and alcohol. And for yeah. others, they they learn to live and adapt to that sensitivity. And uh, yeah. and in fact, there's an interesting interaction with personality. So you find that super tasters, for instance, um, who are very adventurous in terms of personality, actually seek out hot foods. They seek out high alcohol wines, um, whereas super tasters that, uh, that are less uh, adventurous in terms of personality uh, find those sensations very aversive. So they don't tend to eat those foods or, or consume those drinks. Yeah. Well, I find it un uncanny when um, Tim and I was saying, uh, you probably cut the tags out of your clothing. I said, yes, <laughs> like everything is a hypersensitive world. Um, do, do from your studies or other studies that you've read, 
do is it more women than men who are tend to be super tasters is that truth or or myth yeah, look, I mean, both from our own work and from colleagues, yes, it look, looks like you are more likely to be a super taster uh, if you're a woman. It may be as high as, as, as twice as likely. Um, and, of course, uh, uh, women have other advantages too when it comes to wine. They, they tend to be better discriminators. They tend to uh, be able to uh, use words and vocab better to describe what they're sensing in wine. So we're basically a lost cause, us men, Natalie. <laughs> Well, that's what I was getting at, and I'm so glad you've joined us to help prove the point. <laughs> that's great. That's interesting because I do think that, again, this is really grossly generalizing, but if we think of men being more right-brained, spatially, math, all that sort of stuff, and women being more left-brained, logic, words, etc., putting words to aromas, what you said... Um, really picks up on those generalizations for sure. What do you mean by women tend to be more discriminating? What does that mean for you? So most of the work that's been done has looked at odor or smell as opposed to taste. Um, and the work suggests that when you have a, an odorant, an aroma compound at a particular concentration, let's say in wine, you uh, don't need to add as much um, again before women will pick the two samples as being different, whereas you need um, a higher concentration uh, of that odour for men to be able to discriminate between those two smells. Huh. And again, and again, you have this advantage when it comes to labelling. Um, uh, untrained, everything else being equal, a uh, woman uh, uh, can put more accurate um, and consistent labels on what they smell. Now, of course, th th I think these are interesting from a biological perspective, and that's what yeah. we tend to study, yeah. but it doesn't undermine uh, training. I mean, all these things can be improved with education, with training, both taste sensitivity and smell, and our ability to label and recall odors correctly. I mean, that's why education is such fun. We can, um, we can compensate for, if you will, these, these biological differences between wine tasters. Absolutely. Uh, let me just jump back into the comments. This is fantastic. Um, so Elaine Bruce says, fascinating topic. Ellen says, hello. And Louise Boudreau just joined us. Um, Elaine Bruce, definitely on the right track. Science plus wine equals happiness. Um, <laughs> Anne McLean says, hello from Halifax. John Morrison just joined us from Illinois. Marie Walsh is uh, here from Halifax enjoying the River Lore Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. Sam Hawk just joined us from BC. Patty Hollander joined us from Virginia. Um, hello, Sam. Uh, Jim Clark asks, does taste ability degrade with age? Have you done any work on that, Gary? Uh, we haven't done much, but there, there has been a lot done over the years. And uh, the, the short answer is yes, both, both our capacity to um, to smell uh, and taste sensitivity drop off with age, uh, smell uh, much more rapidly, uh, and taste. Once once you hit your forties, there is a there is a slow but um, consistent drop off in in um, what we call taste thresholds. At how much of a compound you need to be able to detect it uh, there in the glass. Um, but of course, as we get older, we get more experience um, with uh, with wine, um, and often become more. Uh, more focused on, on on the senses, and so again, one can compensate in part for this loss of sensitivity just with uh, with experience and, and with mindfulness. That trade off between power or vigor and wisdom, <laughs> the old age thing. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. It applies to wine. Um, Elaine says, "I lost my sense of smell and taste for a bit due to health. They all came back in stages." Uh, but even more so now, I don't think anyone quite believed me. And it was only when a chef called Grant Achatz, oops, um, described what happened to him that it all made sense. Flavors not only in wine, but all tastes is why I'm obsessed with herbs. I often open a wine just to smell it for a while before tasting it. Absolutely, Elaine. Um, Jamie Bothan says, um, my hubby, when I married him, only drank beer. Now he drinks wine. Good for you, Jamie. Um, Peter Nielsen says, I used to consider myself a super taster. I could taste very subtle nuances in food and wine that others couldn't taste. Now uh, I could also smell someone smoking in the car ahead of me on the 401. 
I usually caught a bad cold or flu, or I caught a bad cold or flu two years ago, which nullified my sense of taste. Oh, no. But when I got better, my super taste that I had previously seemed to be gone. I believe some of it's returned. I don't know if I have it to the extent I had before. Um, this Okay. So, yeah. Can you lose your sense of smell like that from a health issue, uh, Gary? Oh, absolutely. Um, so we know, for instance, that uh, that contact sports like uh, like NFL, CFL, um, uh, after head knocks or concussions, it's not uncommon for there to be uh, nerve damage uh, and to actually lead to permanent uh, loss of smell. And that uh, um, that's often associated with a real drop in quality of life. I mean, there's some really heartbreaking tales when one reads about uh, individuals who were you know, very involved in food or wine, foodies, if you will, um, yeah. gastronomes who, who lose their sense of smell through a head injury and how just their quality of life uh, uh, drops off. And, and there are, as some of your viewers have indicated, some sort of short-term um, uh, issues too. So the cold or cold-like um, conditions, sometimes that's due to viruses, and those viruses can um, uh, do some, some temporary damage to, to, to nerves. The good news being often uh, these things recover. Hmm. Wow. Yes, Jamie is saying, I have a friend who has no sense of smell, so she just judges by taste. Wow. Joanna Cortell is here in Toronto. Ag uh, she's got a Greek white wine in her glass. And Lee Chere has joined us from Northern Ontario. Hello. Um, so if you are enjoying this chat, please take a moment to share it. Just hit that share button and let your friends and followers know why you're enjoying it, why they might enjoy it. As you know, at the end of every session, I draw for a winner uh, based on who shared last week's. This week, if you share and comment, uh, Gary Pick, Dr. Pickering has agreed kindly to provide one of his super taster kits that you can use at home to see if you are a super taster. Wouldn't that be fun? You and your friends and family can test yourselves to see if you're a super taster. And finally, if you want to take your wine knowledge to the next level, join me on a free online wine video class at nataliemclean.com forward slash pro. Okay, so Jim Clark asks, is there any way to improve the chance of regaining or improving smell or taste. Um, I don't know if you have an answer for that, or is that too general a question? Are you talking about post-injury, Jim, or just, I'm going to assume just in life, can you, I guess you were saying, Gary, just focus, training, discipline, practice, that kind of thing, I'm sure. Absolutely. And so, I mean, that, that, that's the great news. Yes, there's lots of evidence that, uh, that smell in particular, which is so much of what wine flavour is about, both both here and on the palate, it's largely uh, a smell phenomena. We can greatly improve our acuity uh, just through training. And in fact, that was one of the uh, one of the products that we've commercialised um, from our lab over the years. Um, uh, it's called the Wine Awakenings uh, Aroma Kit, and it was for that very purpose that. Uh, uh, in our training of our undergraduate students at Brock, we often uh, present uh, the, the odours that one finds in both healthy wine and in and faulted wine. And just through a series of, um, of uh, uh, changing the concentration of these compounds and through, through training and reiteration, you, you see huge differences in, in people's performance and in their confidence when it comes to you know, distinguishing and, uh, and labelling odours. And so we developed this kit uh, the wine aroma kit, uh, very similar to uh, Lenin de Vin, uh, to, uh, uh, to give everyone an opportunity to be able to work on it and keep improving their palate and their sense of smell in particular. And are these little bottles with essences or smells that you sort of smell it and then you go over to the wine, see if I smell that, or at least can I identify this? It's cinnamon, it's nutmeg or whatever? Exactly. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, awesome. Yeah. Lee says, practice, practice. I've been um, lacking by only drinking lately and working on other stuff. I need to get back to on the tasting wagon. Gwen Barton has joined us. Um, and Lori Sweet is here from Kingston. Elaine Bruce says, I could smell sulfur from a match as I drove by someone lighting a cigarette. Absolutely. And um, Tom Nolan says, I thought I was a super taster until I got tested and then nothing. <laughs> my sons are super tasters. However, I do think my sense of smell is quite acute, probably from practice, Tom. 
Uh, I think I can smell someone smoking in an area upwind 100 feet away. This seems to enhance my enjoyment of wine, being a super taster, I assume, not the smoking. Um, Cool. So let's talk about the other um, product that you have developed, Gary, the wine mouthfeel wheel. So some of us are familiar with the wine aroma wheel. That was developed by Dr. Ann Noble, Professor Professor Emeritus from UC Davis. But what is it you've developed with the wine mouthfeel wheel? It's very similar to the wine aroma wheel, except um, as you, the name suggests, we focus on the, the tactile mouthfeel uh, sensations in wine, which um, which I think are a huge part of uh, of the pleasure we get from wine. And, Perhaps I could illustrate with some of my own favourite wine styles. You know, I look at local um, local ice wine. You know, we've got that wonderful sweetness and that big kick of uh, of floral notes and 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 canned uh, canned fruits. But so much of uh, ice wine's appeal for me is that wonderful, dense, viscous richness. Those words are describing uh, describing mouthfeel. I love surly Chardonnay. So Chardonnay that's had time uh, time aging on on the dead yeast cells. That lovely creamy texture that fills out the palate. That's all about mouthfeel. Mm. Bubble, champagne, the effervescence, the tingling, the popping of the bubbles in the mouth. It's one of life's uh, real joys. We're talking about, again, mouthfeel sensations. Or well, my all time favorite, uh, when I can afford it, a uh, Grand Cru uh, Burgundy. You know, wonderful Pinot. Wonderful fine grain texture, silky smooth tannins, and those descriptors are not taste, they're not smell, but they're mouthfeel. So I think, um, you know, reflecting on some of the great wines that that each of us uh, uh, may have tried, often mouthfeel was a huge part of the quality, but it's seldom talked about in, in wine circles or even in wine research work. So anyway, long story short, we thought there needed to be um, a vocabulary to enable people to be able to talk about these sensations and also to enable researchers who are looking at optimizing viticultural practices or winemaking practices to be able to see how uh, these treatments ultimately affect uh, the mouthfeel of the wine. You need a vocabulary, you need standards to be able to do that. And so that was the, the driver behind developing this, uh, this product. I have to agree, like the focus in wine is often aromas, then flavors, and we forget about texture. And, you know, when I am at a tasting, a wine will really stand out if it's got this sort of, you know, velvet or liquid silk. I mean, I love when yeah. I can describe a wine like that. And people identify, they say, oh, I get it. I, I, I can feel what you're describing. Texture is so important, and I think we overlook it. Um, when it comes to wine. So you've developed a white wine uh, mouthfeel wheel. So what would be examples? Like how are you categorizing it? Are you saying prickly, smooth, silk, velvet? Like what are your words that you use to describe in in that mouthfeel wheel? So you've actually used several of the words that that are on the wheel. And again, it's analogous to to Anne's uh, wine aroma wheel in which you've got a a three-tier structure in which you have coarse or general sensations. And as you move your way out, uh, they're broken down into finer and finer um, sensations. And so again, silky or velvet or satin are terms that appear on the uh, the very last tier. And uh, with these descriptors are also reference standards. So quite literally one can go away and make up a reference uh, uh, sample to be able to understand what velvet or silk or um, or so on uh, feels like on the palate. Uh, yeah. Oh, so a reference sample. What would that be? If are you trying to create a liquid sample that would approximate, or are you trying to find a wine that would approximate that feel? Actually, none of those. And the main reason okay. is that it would become very very fatiguing. Um, so there are you know, over thirty sensations on the white wine mouthfeel wheel. From memory, I should know this. Let's say about thirty. And it would be uh, very fatiguing for the palate to actually have um, oral sensations, as you know, particularly for things like astringency. You get a buildup very quickly of those uh, of those compounds. Uh, so, in fact, we have manual standards. So, again, if we stick with those um, examples of smoothness, smoothness such such as uh, silk or, or velvet or satin, 
um, we actually have uh, a small squares of satin, small squares of velvet that you can feel, um, you can stroke in such a way to get um, the essence of that sensation and relate it to what you're experiencing in the mouth. Oh, wow. Sounds strange. It's incredibly uh, efficient and people are able to make that, that that translation between what they feel here and what they experience in their On mouth. Their, their tongue. So we don't yeah. lick the samples or the satin or whatever. We're just touching them. Yeah. You could, but we don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> it probably wouldn't taste good. Um, but okay, so I'm intrigued. How would you differentiate a wine that feels like satin versus silk? I don't know if you can describe that or give us an example, but to me, those two things are really similar. I love using both terms. I use them interchangeably, which is probably not correct. But can you differentiate or help us understand what that might feel like, the difference? Absolutely, but uh, again, it's an exercise perhaps best done with, with examples of those fabrics and uh, and you find that when you stro stroke one compared to the other, you do get a little bit more resistance, a bit more bite, um, and one is slightly smoother than the other. And so, Which one is smoother? Uh, again, well, you know what, Natalie, I'd have to look that up. I, oh. I haven't used, uh, I used the wheel in, in several weeks, so I can't recall. In developing it, one of the really interesting things was, though, that we were able to train a panel to be able to reliably differentiate all these sensations, both with the standards, but also with the mouth. So we have a great capacity as humans to uh, to detect and differentiate all these, uh, these sensations. It just needs a bit of training. I love it. There's hope. For everybody i would think the satin would be smoother i just think silk can you know i think of raw silk there's a bit more of a resistance i'm just right. postulating but um let me get back to some of these comments which are pouring in because people are loving this um let me back scroll here to get back to where we were um oh my goodness wow 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 okay uh okay Melanie Lloyd says, so does this mean one can learn to be a super taster or just a better taster? I think, Melanie, what we've talked about is that you can focus and practice and become a much better taster. I think the super taster is more genetic. Am I getting that okay or mixed up there, Gary? Is that... No. That's good. Spot on there. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. Um, Michael Gorbal, Gorbal says, awesome topic, Natalie, Dr. Gary. There are times often when I have a respiratory tract viral infection and to my chagrin, my taste in wine becomes temporarily, thank heavens, distorted. Is there a, a physiological reason for this? So... Again, without knowing the, uh, the, the details of the condition, often, um, not a very pleasant topic, but often we get mucus building up in, oh. in an area um, around the olfactory receptors behind our, behind our nose. And there can be various conditions, um, including lots of inflammation processes that means we get a buildup of mucus. And what that means is that it's harder and harder for the odour compounds in wine to make their way through this physical barrier to be able to bind with the with the odor uh, receptor um, uh, sites and start that whole smell process. So, so, so yes, there is a there is a physiological um, barrier to these odorants um, binding with the right uh, the right receptors. The good the good news being, when the condition clears up, the odors have access to those binding sites and we can smell again. That is so well explained. Thank you, Gary. Um, all right, let me just scroll down here. Uh, Jamie says, I think the best wines are the ones where you get lost when you smell them. Yes, get lost in the aromas. Elaine says, I love the sensory kits. So we'll have to post links to where you can get these sensory kits. As I mentioned, if you share and comment on this video, you could win a Super Taster Kit. But of course, you can buy the Super Taster Kit and the wine aroma, sorry, wine mouthfeel wheels and all the other products that uh, Gary has developed. Um, We'll say this at the end as well, Gary, but what's the website if people are really curious right now, the the URL? Sure. Um, probably the best one is to access all of these products is Pixen, P-I-C-K-S-E-N.com. Okay, Pixen. And we'll definitely post that in the comments. Um, make sure you guys have that. Alejandro Schmidt has joined. Hello, Alejandra. Uh, Phyllis Cook, hi. I'm not a super taster, but I sure would love to be. Uh, I do enjoy good wine and cheese anyway, no matter what. Absolutely. 
you go. <laughs> you go, girl. Um, hello, Alejandra. Dave Head has joined us from Corkstown. Debbie. Uh, Gary is here from Mexico. Awesome. Elaine Bruce, is texture related to body? That's an interesting question. How do those two tie together, Gary? Texture and body. Absolutely. So texture is often used as a as a broad catch-all term for, for mouthfeel. So in that context, body or viscosity or density, um, these are all just components of, uh, of texture. Okay. And um, Lise asks, um, what do formal wine training agencies think of these mouthfeel terms? So I think she's talking about training bodies like maybe WSET and that sort of thing. Are they using your tools yet or do they recognize them or are they part of the training kit or will they be maybe in the future? Yeah, great question. The short answer is outside of... Um, the several universities that, that I'm involved with or I'm aware of that offer wine sensory courses um, in which these products are, are definitely used both here, or both in North America and, uh, and in Australasia. Um, I know the WSET um, use the uh, super tasting kit um, uh, as part of their curriculum, um, but I can't speak more widely than that. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Because there's lots of training bodies that probably could find that very useful as a tool. Um, Jim Clark says he was at the Winnipeg wine show years ago and realized after a while that when tasting, I was literally feeling shapes on my palate. I love how you put that, Jim, feeling shapes on my palate, i.e. the taste hit my mouth in geometric shapes, round, flat points, even triangular, as if it was only specific taste buds that were being hit. Any reaction to that, Gary? I think that's kind of a neat analogy. Yeah, it is. And there's a, a, a relatively rare phenomenon where, where some individuals um, uh, can experience these um, associations between between shape uh, and, and taste and smell. It's like cross-modal? Um, like cross-modal, like anesthesia or whatever it is? or. <laughs> yeah, the synesthesia sort of idea might in fact be happening here. It's, it's, it sounds like it's more than cross-modal. Cross-modal, of course, is very important in, in, in wine. For instance, how how smell affects our perception of um, uh, of taste or of, of mouthfeel. But it sounds like your your, uh, your viewer might be experiencing um, something a little bit more profound. So that that that'll be great research. Send them to my yes. lab. Absolutely. Well, we're going to connect you two in the comments after this. I, I just love how he describes it, like feeling triangles and shapes on his palate. Woo. Uh, Tom Nolan says, I agree and always try to give a description of the body of the wine in my description. Mouthfeel is easy to detect, but difficult to describe. Deb's here from Vancouver. Hi, Deb. Uh, Elaine Bruce, is mouthfeel related to tannins? Um, so what's the tie in there? if at all, between mouthfeel and tannins. Absolutely. So okay. uh, again, um, particularly in the case of red wine, the tannins are the compounds. So they're the typically skin derived compounds from red, red wine, but some, sometimes also seeds and, and, uh, and stems. But the, these compounds um, can cause uh, a wide range of mouthfeel sensations. In fact, the, the examples we were talking about earlier in terms of satin, and velvet um, and so on, they are typically uh, what we call sub-qualities of astringency. And astringency, at least in red wine, is caused by tannins. You know what I get confused with? Um, so we talk about silky tannins, firm tannins, I get all that. But then we get into ripe tannins, or I, and I don't get when we start talking about ripeness or taste of tannins, because for me, tannin is always textural. It's never a taste. But am I off on that? I mean, how how can you describe tan? Can you describe tannin other than a textural feeling? Like, are there what would be a ripe tannin? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. In fact, it's one of my bugbears is just that the use of, I think, confusing, ambiguous language when it comes to mouthfeel. So, on the face of it, let's take the opposite. An unripe tannin has no place in our vocab because. 
what's very likely happening there is that someone that uses that term is in fact confounding two different things, probably three different things, both a smell, a taste, and a texture. The reason for that is that those things are, are typically related. So if you're harvesting red wine, red grapes that haven't reached uh, their peak maturity, maybe the, the, um, you know, the, the, the full sets in early, the, the rains come, you're harvesting stuff that's not, not quite physiologically ripe. And that you tend to get wines that um, have relatively harsh astringency. They tend to have more bitterness and they tend to be slightly greener, greener uh, in terms of aroma because these things are all associated with fruit that's not quite ripe. And so this idea of unripe tannins is likely an amalgamation, you know, a psychological amalgamation of these three different ways of sensing smell, taste and, uh, and mouthfeel. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that because <laughs> I, I thought, am I just not getting this? And then I hear stuff like dusty tannins. What are dusty tannins? <laughs> I, I don't know. How does that relate? I don't want to get off into a rabbit hole, but dusty tannins, how would you define that? Or is that a conflagration as well or confounding of terms? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I think it's, uh, I, I, one often hears that. Um, I'd even caution about using the word tannin at all when it comes to describing wine. I, again, think it's it's, it's um, not helpful. We can take white wine as a great example. We get astringency in white wine. We get a whole bunch of sensations, uh, tactile sensations in white wine that have nothing to do with tannins. So, for instance, acids, the acids we find in both in white and red wine, also elicit astringency. And, and so we don't know um, whether or not a particular sensation is, is due to a tannin or due to an acid or due, or due to a protein or something else. So I don't find those terms particularly helpful. I'd suggest we get back to just describing sensation rather than trying to ascribe which compounds that sensation comes from, because I don't think we're equipped to do that. I get it. Like, just say it's drying or it's a furry mouth or it's something like Absolutely. something somebody can identify with. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Okay, so great. We figured that one out. Good. <laughs> okay. I'm going to backtrack here again. Carolyn Hetke has joined us from Toronto. Hello, Carolyn. Um, and I find if I'm taking an allergy pill, it dries my nose out and limits sensations as well. That makes sense. When you were talking about mucus and colds and everything else, Gary, that totally makes sense that if you've got a dry nasal passage, I would think that's limiting what you can perceive on aromas, flavors, everything else. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and uh, Heather Proctor has joined us. And let me keep scrolling because it's going by too fast. Um, Lee Shire says, some different textures put me in a mood. Example, crisp texture makes me want to run off the dock into a lake. Full-bodied, silky texture makes me want to get in front of the fire. That's very evocative, Lee. I like that. Uh, Lori Sweet says, is there a mouthfeel wheel for both red and white wine? Which is exactly what I was going to ask. Are you going to do one for red wine, Gary? I would love to say yes, Natalie, but unfortunately, the, the Australians have beaten us to it. Oh, so no. several years ago. I know. <laughs> uh, of, all, of all the countries, the Australians, several years ago, uh, Richard Gall and some of my colleagues um, uh, at Adelaide University uh, in, in Australia uh, developed the red wine uh, mouthfeel wheel. Um, okay. So, so it exists. Is no. But how about exists. other styles? Uh, or is it necessary? Um, like sparkling mouthfeel wheel, dessert mouthfeel wheel, or would there not be that much differentiation or... Is there room for those wheels too? Yeah, I certainly think that there's more room for that. I think the key is that the the research and science is done behind behind it. Um, right. It's easy to come up with a bunch of descriptors and to call it whatever you wish, but uh, to have that validated um, uh, you know science behind it, I think is key. Uh, I think sparkling wine is an interesting one. Um, we we do have uh, in the white wine mouthfeel wheel. There is a, a component, um, a segment, if you wish, uh, of the of the wheel that is dedicated to sparkling wine, uh, but I still think there's there's more room to um, you know, to more fully describe some of those wonderful nuances of sensation when we're trying uh, champagne and, and, and other types of bubbles. 
Yeah, it is such a textural experience. Uh, one for Rosé, Lee suggests. Yes. Um, Michael Gorball, my daughter-in-law deems herself a super taster. She deems herself. Um, <laughs> she is not enamored of bubblies. I feel sad that this happens for special occasion situations. It's often hard to please everyone in seasoning, seasoning and therefore pairing a wine with food. Any best answers, Dr. G, to do a workaround? So what's the question here? So she doesn't want bubblies because she's a super taster. Um, so do you, uh, do you have any suggestions there, Gary? Or I can reread the comments again. Is that coming clear to you? <laughs> I, think, I think I get the, okay. the gist of it. And, okay. and um, it's... It's something we've seen in our own research that, um, at least in the US, with US consumers, that, that super tasters, I mentioned before, they tend to prefer sweeter styles. What I didn't mention is that they give lower liking ratings to, to bubbles, to sparkling wine, uh, to, and to dry red wine and dry white wine. And one of the possible reasons for that is bubbles for you and I uh, might be seen as pleasant, but but CO2, carbon dioxide, the thing that gives us bubbles is what's called, is an irritant. It's called a trigeminal irritant. And, uh, and, and that goes from no sensation through to pain. And so it's conceivable that super tasters are actually experiencing the irritation of carbon dioxide uh, much more intensely um, to the point that it becomes unpleasant. So, so that observation um, of, of your viewer's daughter, I think, is consistent with what we see. Now, what to do about it? I don't know. We could try uh, serving our bubbles a little bit warmer. As you know, um, the, 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 the bubbles are, are not retained in solution as long when the, when the wine is served warmer. That may make the irritation less, uh, less for her. Um, but there's 101 wine styles, so I'd say try and move her sideways into something that she enjoys drinking and uh, let's all celebrate our, our diversity in terms of uh, the wines that we like. Absolutely. And maybe a frizzante, something less sparkly, less less aggressive bubbles, if you will. The trigeminal, what you just said, my dentist said I have trigeminal nerves, like extra nerves, so that when I get a, lucky me, when I get a, a filling, I have to get extra freezing. Because is that related to nerves, trigeminal? Apparently, yes, I've been blessed with all the extras. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. So, so the trigeminal nerve is one of the main nerves that um, that appears throughout our, our face and our, our oral cavity, and, and and the nerve endings from that particular nerve are the things that respond to with bubbles, with irritation of alcohol, um, with heat and cold, and so on. So, Great. you're being blessed or cursed with greater sensitivity to those uh, those. To sensations. that and a super taster, I should just shut down this show right now and just drink milk or no, something. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, cool. Uh, we've got some great questions coming in. Peter Nielsen, any comment on taste memory? I was spoiled many years ago when around age 22, I was lucky enough to share a bottle of 1961 Moussigny from Burgundy. It was, without any question whatsoever, the most delicious, memorable wine of my life. Let me click for more here. Um, unfortunately, it's out of my price range. I remember it. Drinking liquid velvet notes of tomato. It was exquisite. If I, and I can if I can remember it like it was yesterday, is this memory real or imagined? Wow, some interesting questions. Um, not sure if that's within your scope, but uh, any comments on that, Gary? I don't know where to go with that, other than to other than to just just say that you know it, often we do have deep. Uh, deep and lasting memories when we can attach uh, um, intense experiences with emotion. And so if yeah. there was a lot of problem with emotion being evoked at the time that, um, that your viewer tried that wine, then yeah. those that, 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 that tends to mean that that memory is, uh, uh, is more embedded um, and, and also has more valency. It, it means more and it's more likely to be recalled later in life. So Love it. I think we all, we all wish we had more experiences like that. Exactly. That's a good wrap-up phrase because I cannot believe we're at 10 to the hour. And I didn't get on to the other subjects. So um, fantastic. Really great discussion, Gary. Um, I know we didn't get on to the whole climate thing, but we'll save that for another time. 
Um, is there anything that we didn't cover that you'd specifically like to mention before we wrap up? I don't think so, Natalie. I've, I've really enjoyed this and I'd yeah. be very happy to, uh, to come fantastic. back some other time if you uh, Yes, if you wish. I would love it because your your scope is much broader than even I was just looking at research. Like you just know a lot of stuff about a lot of stuff uh, to put it in non-academic terms. Um, but and where can people find you online? We've talked about where they can get the Super Taster Kit. We're going to make sure we post that in the links below. But where can they find you and or your research or any other websites you want to mention or social media channels, whatever you like? I just think if individuals are interested in the research, just to, to Google Gary Pickering uh, at Brock University, there'll be Great. several several links there. I'll be happy to, uh, to chat further with them. Awesome. That's great. All right, folks, uh, stay online with me, um, even though as we wrap up with our guests now. But uh, Gary, thank you for spending your time. I mean, it was just fascinating. I, again, I haven't got to the other 52 questions, but <laughs> this was a great chat. I, I really sincerely appreciate you taking the time with us tonight. Thanks, Natalie. I've really enjoyed myself. Okay, awesome. Well, say cheers for now, and uh, we must chat again. <laughs> yes, cheers. Right, cheers. <laughs> All right, take care. Bye for now, Bye. Gary. All right, folks, please stay online. What a great chat. I mean, superb. He was answering questions I didn't even realize were part of his knowledge. So, yes, so stay with me here. Um, I know we're getting up toward the hour. I'm going to announce a winner for the sign book for Mary. Um, this week, I'm going to release more details about the wine and cheese pairing course. I'm so excited. I've been just so taking the deep dive into wine and cheese plates. I am very, very excited about this course that we are going to launch after the U.S. Thanksgiving. Of course, I'm here in Canada, but um, I know it's a busy time for everyone in the United States. So we're going to open registration on November 28th. Woo! You know, last night I was at a dinner party. I hosted it. And I was telling the backstory of all these different cheeses. And people were gripped. I think there's something tribal about gathering around a cheese plate and telling the backstories. And people are digging in and loving it. Yes, cheese, Lise. <laughs> cheese, Lise. Um, yes, I'm so glad you guys all enjoyed this discussion tonight. Oh, my goodness. Look at you all piling in. Very good. I'm so Glad. It was great. Okay, so I need to get over to <laughs> Mary Ewing Mulligan. Um, in terms of that chat uh, the previous week, last week, it was great chat. She was, um, you know, the author of Wine for Dummies, uh, but she's a master of wine, so she is no dummy. And um, she just had a great chat about uh, all things wine. And I am toggling down because it is elapsing my memory as to who won the signed copy of her book. So I'm just I'm just Googling down here, not Googling, scrolling down. Um, so stay with me and I will give you the winner in a minute. So guys, what was the most valuable thing you learned tonight? What was the most interesting insight? Gary Pickering had so much to share. It, I just was blown away with... You know, and he had even told me he was a nervous speaker. I didn't find that at all. I mean, just he just went into it with all his conversation and insights. There we are. Here are all the shares from last week. So I do choose these real time. Ah, here we go. Anne-Marie Chivers, you are the winner. Woohoo! So if you take a moment to share this video tonight and comment, you can win a cop or copy. A super, super Taster wine kit. They're 50 bucks, by the way. Worth buying, but you could win one. All right. So, Anne-Marie Chivers, um, <laughs> you uh, have won a copy of the Wine for Dummies book. So next week, guys, who have I got? I've got Christine Sismondo. She contributes drink articles, including lots of wine content, to the Globe and Mail. Of course, Beppy is the regular columnist, but Christine is his right-hand woman. So she's always filling in when Beppy is on vacation or otherwise indisposed. She is with us next week. She's a smart woman who teaches literature at York University and has published several books on drinks. 
So come back next week. I appreciate you being here. Um, stay tuned for all the exciting news. I've got a new podcast that's going to be launching soon. The new audiobook for Red, White, and Drunk All Over is now live. Woohoo! On Audible, Amazon, iTunes. Go find it. Um, and the wine and cheese course. So much going on. It's hard to pack it all in. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to seeing you next week at 6 p.m. Eastern. Bye for now. Cheers, guys.